Hey everyone, this is Dr. Ted Lin again. Today's date is, God, March 19th, uh, and it's a Thursday. I'm getting my dates all mixed up because everything is starting to come uh, kind of cloud together and everything is moving pretty quick. So as uh, discussed earlier in some of our other videos, uh, I wanted to bring other people onto this, um, this podcast or this uh, video uh, series that I have to bring different perspectives. So today I have uh, Mike Brown here uh, with us. Uh, he's, a, he's a good friend of mine, uh, a lot of you, since a lot of this uh, is going to family and friends, a lot of you might recognize him. So uh, this is uh, us uh, 10 years later or more. We're both back in Colorado. So uh, uh, Mike, I'll let you uh, kind of take it away, you know, give a little introduction in terms of, you know, kind of who you are, what you do and, and what you bring to the table. Yeah, thanks, Ted. I'm, I'm super excited to be here. And, and I just want to say, you know, I, I think that uh, what you're doing trying to put out good information here is, is super important. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of bad information and, and a lot of opinions out there. So trying to, to put out fact-based information to actually help people make better decisions is a, is a really important role. So I just want to commend you for, for stepping up to the plate and doing that. And uh, by way of intro, uh, as Ted said, my name is Mike Brown. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, maybe uh, germane to the conversation uh, as far as bios go, um, uh, formal Naval aviator. I flew F-18s for the Navy, uh, which is what I was doing in San Diego when I met Ted 10 years ago. Um, and uh, since then, I got out of the Navy in 2011 and uh, started an energy company, uh, which I sold last year uh, for an eight-figure exit. So uh, I know a couple things about, about business. I know a couple things about uh, tactical planning and, and kind of use both of those skills to, to make some, to formulate my opinion around this uh, virus situation, which we're going to discuss today. Okay, that's fantastic. So yeah, you know, a big reason why I brought uh, Mike uh, on board is because I think kind of having experience with the military also, you know, this is also going to have some economic impacts as well, or quite quite a lot. So I think uh, this is a good combination of, you know, looking at, hey, you know, if, if you were military, you know, how do you assess risk? How do you go into the unknown? And also, uh, since Mike has a lot of experience with, you know, kind of the, on the business side of things, uh, I think we might touch upon in terms of Hey, you know, how is this going to impact uh, all of us economically and as ourselves and for our family? You know, what's a good way to look at the situation? How do you game plan for that in case this thing does drag on? So, hey, Mike, why don't you kind of start? You know, we had we had already talked about a lot of, you know, in terms of, you know, just risk and risk management and just how humans are just inherently not very good at figuring out risk. So, uh so I'll let, you know, Mike kind of take it away and, and touch upon some of the points, because I think when we talked about it, this all started when he had posted a Facebook uh, post, which uh, I thought was really interesting, you know, because, you know, Mike, I think uh, you had, you know, you had a photo of your, your trunk just filled with stuff. And uh, you know, that caught my attention, because uh, I think usually when we think of, uh, you know, people going out buying a bunch of uh, supplies, right, I usually don't put my friends who have military experience in that category. So... I'll let you kind of take it away and, and comment on uh, kind of how you get, got to that post. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, um, you know, as you said, humans are definitely bad at managing risk. And uh, both in the Navy and as an oil and gas investor, um, my job has always been somewhat broken down to managing risk and assessing risk. And, and there are a couple points, uh, I think, that are worth uh, talking about. The first one is, is... Um, what's really wild to me in this scenario is how attached people have been to their opinions. Uh, and, and when it comes to managing risk, opinions are actually not very useful. Uh, you know, I can look at a data set and I can predict a bunch of different outcomes. Getting attached to which one of those outcomes is going to happen actually creates a really bad environment for me to make decisions because now I have a confirmation bias and I'm looking for information that's going to support the opinion that I have about what might happen rather than uh, objectively viewing the entire data set and making decisions based on what could plausibly happen. And so that's, I think, the big thing uh, for me leading up to last week. And, you know, now um, some of this stuff looks uh, a little different in hindsight, but, you know, basically uh, as this thing started to ramp up on people's radars, there was a lot of talk about, about panicking and fear and how the media is driving this fear thing. And uh, I think that's a really dangerous way to look at this thing because what, what I did was basically say, okay, I can see what the situation is in Italy currently. 
And then, then I asked myself, is it plausible that that situation could come to pass in the US? Is that a likely outcome? Well, I don't know if it's a likely outcome or not, but it's definitely plausible. Can I see ways that that might actually come to pass in the US? I can. Okay, now I'm gonna move into action. If, if I think that there is a 30 day quarantine uh, like it's happening in Italy, that's plausible in the US, what action steps am I gonna take in order to prepare myself and my family for that? So that's going out and, and doing exactly what, what a lot of us have done now, which is buying groceries, uh, stocking up on a thing. And, you know, and there's all these terms, panic buying. I wasn't panic buying. I very calmly and collectively stocked my freezer for, for 30 days worth of food and then brought my family uh, into the house. And, and there's no one leaving or coming. And uh, you know, we're kind of relying on Amazon for things that, uh, that we forgot. But basically, we're stocked up for 30 days and, and planning on writing this thing out. You know, again, that's not a fear-based decision. It's not because I'm afraid of the virus or I'm afraid of uh, mortality rates. I just looked at the situation and go, okay, you know, could our medical community be overwhelmed in this nation? Yes, that is a very probable outcome if nothing is done. So if social distancing is a way to keep that from happening, it, the upside for me to engage in that behavior is much greater than the downside. So, you know, a lot of times uh, when we're looking at an investment, we try and, and look for what's called asymmetric returns. And the concept of asymmetric returns is low downside and, you know, uh, 5x or greater upside. So, you know, an example of that, um, you know, when, uh, when you're buying stock options, uh, they actually have capped downside. You know that you can't risk more than your principal, but if, if, the uh, stock goes in the direction that you, you're planning on or you're betting on, then you actually might have a five, 10 or you know, massive return opportunity with a limited downside. So that's an example of asymmetric returns. When it's applied to this situation, the asymmetric re return is stocking up on food and being ready for a 30 day shutdown. Because here, here are the basic scenarios. Either I don't stock up and it doesn't come to pass, I basically lost nothing. I do stock up and it doesn't happen. Okay, I'm out 500 or $1,000 worth of groceries and it's stuff that I'll eat eventually. I stocked up my freezer, so you know, I'll pull it out over the, over the next six months, but I've lost very little. Um, now, if the restriction or, or a, a quarantine does come to pass and I've stocked up, well, you can see that's a massive upside. <laughs> and if I haven't, I'm, I put myself and my family in a very bad situation now. Now I have to risk going out. I have to keep going to the grocery store. All that could have been avoided by just some simple planning. And, and when, when you see you know, what's happening in America, you basically have two camps. You have, you have people who are either saying, I don't think this is a big deal and I'm going to keep living my life. And you have people saying, hey, this could be a very big deal and I'm going to take appropriate precautions, right? And the people um, in the first camp are saying, this is no big deal, I'm gonna keep living my life, are then trying to label people who are making preparations as, as panicking and, and like I said, are acting out of fear. And it's really quite the, quite the opposite. Uh, you know, this is, this is a very calculated decision for the well-being of my family and, and for the well-being of the greater society, right? I mean, hey, even if I do have the virus, I wanna limit my, my exposure to other people uh, so that I'm not creating unsafe situations for people who aren't as healthy and fit as me. Uh, you know, who, who may be affected a, a lot more severely than I am by this disease. So, you know, that's kind of the way I'm looking at the risk is let me assess all of the various outcomes that could come to pass, decide which ones I'm going to uh, react based on, and then prepare for those eventualities. And again, looking for asymmetric returns, I'm not, I didn't stock up on three years worth of food, right? That's probably overreacting in, in, in too great of a fashion. But I think we can all agree that you know, in the next 30 days, things are going to be weird. So that's probably a, a good amount of food that didn't, you know, that most people have the ability to do. And, and I realize that the position of privilege, not a lot of people in this country, uh, you know, that live paycheck to paycheck have the opportunity to go buy a thousand dollars worth of food and stock up. So there is a tremendous amount of privilege in being able to do that. But also if you have that privilege, why would you not take advantage of it? And that's the thing that's, that's, it's kind of uh, been tough for me to understand is, you know, when people don't have to go to work, when they're not essential personnel, when they have the ability to work from home, why wouldn't they engage in those behaviors that could potentially keep us all safe? Right, and I think also just, you know, being in a, you know, I think a lot of us are in a position of privilege in terms of what can we do to help our community? Because, 
you know, this is not something that you're going to be able to ride out on your own, right? Even if you're in a position of privilege, yeah, you could lock yourself up in your, your castle with a moat. Uh, this is something that affects everyone. You can already see that this is not just a U.S. issue, not just an Italy issue, not just a China issue. This is a global issue, you know, and this is much more than kind of what's going on here, you know, even in your own family, right? This kind of goes on to your community, state level, national level, and also global level. So this is really something that I think, you know, just as human beings that we're going to have to kind of come together and, and figure this thing out. Because this is, uh, if you look at what happened, how things are going with China, how things uh, are going currently with Italy, you know, this may not get cleared up in a month or so. You know, if you look at just you know, track records and what happened. And I think kind of when you brought up investments, you know, and not holding on to your opinions, right? I think that's really important because an in investment, right? You know, you hold on to your opinion, you start losing your, you know, you start losing your ass pretty quick, right? So, totally. Yeah. So you really have to look at the data. And I think that's kind of what, you know, for a lot of us that, you know, looked at it and was like, hey, you know, this, we might have a problem, right? So you started early on in, you know, kind of January, February, you look at the data coming out of China and it was pretty concerning. And you take that next step and you're like, okay, well, let's kind of look at, you know, you know, as, as, as physicians, we're, we're taught to be skeptics, right? You don't want to jump on the, especially in our medical field, you know, in our medical, um, you know, kind of way things are run in the U.S., right? There, there is kind of, there is capitalistic intentions, right? You know, money does play a big role. So you, you want to be able to be a skeptic to say, hey, you know, is this treatment, is this medication that's coming out, is it going to work? Is it the best bang for a buck? Or is this just someone throwing bad data at me saying that this is going to help my patients when it doesn't? Uh, so, you know, we're, we're taught to be skeptics. So kind of going back again, looking at the China data, hey, you know, is it because they're not releasing proper data? Is it because there's a lot of smokers out there? Is it because, you know, they just have crappy healthcare? You know, so those are all kind of things that, you know, we were looking at initially before it got out of China. And then when it got to Italy, now we're like, okay, well, I guess we'll find out pretty quick whether or not, because now you have another country that is a democracy, that has a very good nationalized healthcare system, to be able to give you again more data, right? To and in some ways to com confirm, man, whatever that China has been putting out was absolutely legit. And we're looking at those numbers are really starting to back up. It's really starting to line up. So I think that's part of the reason why all of a sudden it went from nobody really, you know, kind of caring too much until wow, this is really, you know, really something where quarantine are starting to come into effect. There's just been a lot more of a response really quick. And if you look at how fast has changed? It's probably within a week or so, right? Where where it just felt like it kind of completely swung on me. So yeah, totally. And I, and I think that there's there's some statistics out there, and there's some myth busting that, that's kind of worth doing, you know. And and so one thing I've been hearing a lot around Italy is, oh well, it's 99% old people or, or pre pre exist uh, pre existing conditions, which you know uh, that I think skews uh, people's idea of, of, of how serious this thing can be. Um, and, and again, I, I want to make clear, I have no opinion on how serious it is. I don't know if it's serious or not. What I do know is that, you know, there's anecdotal evidence of people our age, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, having to be hospitalized on respirators. That's not a sickness I want to get. You know what I mean? This is not a chance that I'm, that I'm willing to take. And again, it's just, it's looking at that, at that return, like, hey, uh, you know, yes, am I going to die, right? We, we keep hearing about mortality rate as being this, as, as like the panacea of, of the most important thing. I ultimately don't care whether the, the mortality rate is 4% or 0.4%. Um, what I do know is that this can be a very serious illness for a, a certain percentage of those affected with it. So, you know, we're, we're looking at data and saying, you know, the CDC is saying 40 to 70% of Americans could get infected with this virus over the next 18 months. Okay, well, let's, let's take the low number there. Let's call it, let's call it uh, 40% of people. So, you know, roughly 170 million Americans might get infected with this thing. Okay, of those, 5 to 10%, maybe you're going to be hospitalized. Okay, you know, that's more hospital beds than we have with respirators. We have about 120,000 max respirators available for people in the US. And when you're saying 40% of 170 million, or, or sorry, five to 10% of 170 million, you're looking at 1.7 million people for 100,000 respirators. That's a problem, right? And so just dismissing this as, oh, it's for old people or they already have pre-existing pre conditions. 
if you're really healthy and you would have survived, but you can't get access to a respirator, that's a problem. And so, you know, these are things that people, I think are, are really bad at understanding what the risk is there. Of like, hey, I'm not afraid of getting it because I'm young. Well, okay, uh, you know, in, under normal conditions, if you have access to medical care, yeah, you shouldn't probably be that afraid of getting it. It could get really painful, but you're probably going to live. Unless all of a sudden, one in 50 people is, uh, is getting a respirator that needs one, now your, your chances of survival can actually decrease dramatically. So, so, you know, that's another place where I think people are, are pretty bad at assessing risk is just looking at the overall numbers, you know, uh, mortality rate goes up if people can't access medical care. Yeah, I think that, I think that's a great point. Yeah. I think something that people, you know, I think with viruses and kind of, you know, it's hard for people to really grasp, right. In terms of what it necessarily needs. I think a good example that people will understand is like, for example, I work at a critical access hospital. So we're a small hospital. We don't have the big trauma teams. We don't have the ability to shift in more resources if there's a big issue, right? So, for example, if uh, someone gets in a car accident, if they are 20 years old versus if they are 80, right? Same car accident, same type of, you know, kind of mechanism, uh, same type of uh, traumatic forces, same type of injuries. Yes, that 80-year-old with comorbid conditions is going to have a lot higher chance at dying. That 20 year old is probably gonna make it through just because they have all the you know, physiological reserves, but they still need medical care. Just because you don't die doesn't mean that you don't need to be in a hospital, right? So, and another thing that I think people understand is, you know, I can handle in my hospital, given the, the staff that we have at any given time, which is pretty limited, right? I work in the ER, solo doc, we have probably what, two or two, two nurses, you know, and we could shift in, well, we actually only have one nurse, and we could shift in another. So if you have, for example, uh, a bus that gets into a wreck, right? All of a sudden, hey, you know, our, our capacity is overloaded real quick. EMS has to go ahead and send people to other hospitals that could be closest as ones as 20 minutes away. Other hospitals we're looking at 40, 50 minutes, right? So then all of a sudden changes really quick. Now, if it's a train wreck, right? Airplane, like, you know, your 747 crashes, right? A lot of people that could have lived and that could have survived based on the medical interventions that we could give them, right? All of a sudden, those people, doesn't matter if you're young, you're old, you're healthy, or whatever it is, those people are not going to survive. So I think when people look at it from a, from a perspective of trauma, and that's kind of what I do at, you know, Conejos, then all of a sudden you start understanding, man, like, this is a problem. Like, it doesn't matter if I'm 20 years old, I don't want to get it, right? Because, you know, guess what? Let's bust some of these myths, right? You know, what are you, what are you hearing? Like, hospitalizations, right? It's, you know, when it, the data that came out of China was 20% got hospitalized. Now, there was no data in terms of breaking down the age, the comorbidity or whatnot, right? But now you're looking at Italy, Italy is starting to come out and say, hey, you know, in their ICUs, their median age is 65, 65, which is median, which means that half the people who land in the ICU, they're older than 65, the other half younger than 65, right? Now, all of a sudden, right? I mean, that that's kind of our age group, right? This falls it, you know, their range is as young as 20 is who's been ending up in ICUs. And then if you look at early data coming out of New York, right, exact same thing. I think they, they were quoting something like 10 to 15% need a hospitalization. And again, median age was about 65, you know? So, so I think that gives people an idea that this is not just something for, you know, kind of old, you have a lot of medical conditions or whatnot, you know? potentially this could also kind of land you in the hospital even if you're young. Another thing that I wanted to just kind of touch on real quick and we could kind of go into the myth, myth busting later is you know initially a lot of people were comparing this to the flu um, and you know from a medical perspective flu doesn't usually doesn't kill you flu alone. It puts you at a higher risk because your body's weakened, you have a lot more issues, it exacerbates your comorbid conditions and on top of that it puts you at a higher risk for secondary pneumonia. Now, with this coronavirus, this COVID-19, what happens is you actually get um, an atypical viral pneumonia uh, that, will, that will put you, that will you know, kind of wreak havoc on your lungs, causes massive inflammation, your oxygenation is, is an issue. And we're also finding out that on top of lung issues, uh, potentially there's also cardiac issues. If you look at risk factors, you know, the biggest risk factor in China of uh, death is actually not respiratory issues, surprisingly. That came down number, on number three. The top two were actually hypertension and uh, cardiovascular disease. 
So again, you know, there is probably some sort of um, link between cardiac uh, kind of manifestations that's causing the comorbidities and, uh, or morbidity as well as mortality, not just, you know, kind of your, your respiratory issues. So I think that's important for people to understand that, you know, when you look at flu, like the reason why we don't freak out too much about flu is, yeah, flu, not a whole lot that you could do to treat, but it's the, the secondary conditions that get you. Coronavirus has a primary mechanism that will cause havoc within your body. And then you're still susceptible to all the secondary pneumonia, the bacterial pneumonias, the fungal, you know, kind of infections and anything else that, you know, if you had some underlying condition that will potentially get exacerbated that much further. So that's part of the reason why this is so much more of a problem than just, you know, your typical seasonal flu. And, you know, prior to this, you saw the numbers on seasonal flu, you know, quoting these numbers. If you take a look at just how potentially uh, bad coronavirus, this coronavirus could be, all of a sudden it opens up a, a huge uh, can of worms. So. Yeah, and, and, and I, I think that there's a great point with what exactly you just said, which is how bad this could be. And here's the thing that I really want to uh, continue to point out to, to people listening is, you and I are not married to any opinion on this, on how bad this thing is. What we're doing is looking at the data that we currently have and, and making an assessment that, hey, this could be potentially more dangerous than people are giving it credit for. However, if more data continues to come out and it's not as bad, then we're going we're gonna to reassess our position and go, hey, all right, maybe it wasn't as bad as we thought, and we're going to be happy about that, right? The, and, and then when you look at people taking the reverse and going, oh, it's no big deal, again, where, where's the upside versus the downside? You know, if, if you and I in a week or, or three weeks or in, in three months look alarmist and go, okay, no, 70% of people weren't going to get it and, and we didn't flood the medical system okay, that's fine. Like I have no problem <laughs> revising my opinion now and going, okay, yeah, hey, the data is actually showing it's not as dangerous as we thought. We went a little overboard on precaution, but we were acting with the data that we had at the time. And, and the data that we have right now is, is showing us that this could be a very dangerous thing. Yeah. So let's, uh, you know, I want to kind of go back. Uh, you, have, you have talked about myth, myth busting and there, there's yeah. certainly just a lot that's kind of going out, out there. So, you know, I figured we'd take some time and kind of talk about, you know, some of the, you know, kind of either rumors, myths, you know, what people are concerned about. So um, what, have you, what have you heard, you know, in your circles? What are some of the things that you're concerned about for your own family um, that you haven't really been able to get real clear answers on? Or even if you have gotten some clear answers that you think you know, might be good because the questions keep on coming up for people who do call you, for example, your family and friends, and who are like, hey, Mike, saw your Facebook posts. You know, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I think what would be really helpful for people, uh, Ted, is with your expertise in, in medical training and pathology, if, if we could actually have a better understanding of, of how viruses spread, not, not just COVID-19, but, you know, viruses in general, like, like how do these things spread? You know, what's the danger with surfaces versus human to human contact versus airborne? And, and you know, how, how do we actually mitigate this risk? What's, so basically what I'm asking is, what are the things that we should be doing? And then what are the things that are actually kind of futile and probably not worth doing as far as trying to stop the spread? Got it. So, so I think, you know, um, I'll kind of give it to you from a, a somewhat of a hospital perspective, because I think there's just not a whole lot of data, right? You know, kind of in terms of, you know, so let's kind of talk about surfaces, for example. So that, that question comes up a lot as, man, like, you know, it's like, do I have to worry about the elevator buttons, right? Handles. Every time you reach for handles, God, when was the last time someone kind of touched this, right? So data that we have right now, so kind of how they do it, again, this in the lab is very different than the real world, right? Because you have temperature changes, you have the sun beating down on it, there's all these variables, right? But right now, at least with the initial early studies, right, is so it, it looks like stainless steel plastics is about three days, cardboard is about, you know, 24 hours, give or take. Um, and, you know, there's, again, any sort of live surfaces or anything else, we just don't know. And even that data is a little bit susceptible because what they do is they, they put the virus pretty much in the drum, right, uh, uh, with whatever surface that they have. Their temperature is about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and they go ahead and they test the, the, the amount of viruses that's still there after X, Y, and Z time. So I can't tell you that it does decay exponentially. So it's not like, you know, it kind of sits around or whatnot. So two, three hours later, a lot better than one or two hours or just when someone just sneezes on it, right? So I think surfaces is hard to say. Um, kind of what we do at the hospital. So 
you know, the other thing to, to piggyback off of that is everybody's kind of concerned, you know, everybody has these like N95 masks, right? You know, it's like, oh, I want to, I need to get a respirator and things like that. You know, it looks like this is a droplet, you know, it spreads by droplets. So what happens is I go ahead and I sneeze, right? I, you know, there's all these droplets, like we've seen it before. You felt it when, you know, kind of your kid has come up to you, caught the sneeze, right? It's like all over you. Those droplets, right, is it has viral, it has viruses in there, it has a viral load. So when it kind of goes ahead and you know, lands, on the, you know, lands on you direct, right, uh, that's a potential form of transmission. That's the reason why they say social distancing six feet, right, four to six feet, because you know, that's kind of the estimate, man, if I really coughed or sneezed hard, that's how far the droplets can transmit is about six feet. So that's why you have that six feet you know, kind of recommendation here in Colorado, if you're going out, you know, try and maintain that six feet distance. And that's, uh, that's where they get that from. So the other thing is if it lands on surfaces, right? You, you sneeze, it lands on the surface, you know, you, that glistening, you know, kind of sneeze that your kid kind of put on the, your computer screen or whatever it is, right? So yeah. if, that, if that doesn't get cleaned up, what happens is, right, I touch my computer, you know, it's, I, you know, I mess around with it, I, I type an email to you, and then, you know, like what I think most of us have realized, it's really hard not to touch your face, right? You go ahead, you're thinking, you know, you're doing whatever. That, again, virus goes from your, your surface, goes onto your, your body, your mouth, again, mode of entry into your lungs. So I think those are kind of things that you want to kind of concern. N95 mask, is it really useful? No. I mean, unless you're, you know, in the hospital right now, our precautions, you know, we don't even have precautions for N95 masks in the hospital unless someone is high risk at this point. Again, droplet precautions. So if you're going out, you're putting an N95 mask, Sure, you know, that, that might help you feel a little bit better, but for all intents and purposes, it's not gonna make a huge difference one way or another for you to catch a coronavirus. It's not floating around out there, it's not airborne. A lot of people are like, hey, should I turn off my heat or AC, right? Because is it circulating in the air, you know, when I turn that on? No, it's, it's not, it's not gonna, like those droplets, right? I guess in theory, if it dries out, like, you know, if it's just the, the virus itself, right, the virus is small enough that maybe it could float, you know, but usually not, right? If you do not have anything that aerosolizes uh, or makes smaller droplets that could float through the air, that's not going to be an issue. Okay, so when you see like the news where people are in there to have their full body, you know, kind of bio suits, right? A lot of times they're dealing with, you know, again, it's over, it's a precaution, it's a uh, we just want to make sure it's over precaution, but in a hospital, same type of thing. You know, we, we don't put everybody in negative pressure uh, rooms or whatnot, because if you're not doing an aerosolized procedure where there's smaller droplet that's going in the air, right? The risk is not quite there. So you don't have to worry about ventilation or whatnot. If you want to go ahead and put yourself a, a higher rate of filter that will filter out viruses. If you want to go ahead and do that, caveat to that is you, know, you want to clean that out because if you don't if you have a dirty filter that's going to shut down and break down your system so so that's like the the big myth with like surfaces airborne and whatnot you know so all these people that are hoarding n95 masks so that we can't get to it because there's going to be a big shortage of protect uh, personal protective equipment and uh, for medical personnel you know you're just doing a huge disservice to medical com uh, community when you're going out getting n95s and and that's also kind of the difference, you know, when you hear, you know, the surgeon general saying, quit buying masks, right? It's not going to make right. a difference. Hand washing, right? Because really, what's the chances of it getting aerosolizing in the air that you're going to breathe in? Pretty small. Everybody's highest risk is really surfaces, right? So that's why. Right. So, so, so talk to me about like, uh, like getting Amazon packages delivered. Mm -hmm. uh, say that the Amazon worker or the, or the UPS guy sneezes on my on my cardboard package what what precautions can i take when i'm bringing that package into my home yeah so what i do is i actually have a you know i have a bottle of uh 10 bleach and water uh when packages get delivered i just spray it down right just kind of get get some gloves or whatever it is and you don't need these like medical gloves right just go ahead and get your dishwashing glove or whatever it is you know go ahead and just i just go ahead and i just spray it down let it dry off, right? Come back, pick it up and open up and that's it. Now I do spray it down at, again, upside versus downside, right? It takes me what? Three seconds to spray that down, right? Bleach, 10% bleach with water doesn't cost a whole lot. Again, not a whole lot of downside to spray it down, right? Just again, most of it's probably for a peace of mind, but hey, I don't know, right? It could be, it could last longer, but why not spray it down? It's those asymmetrical returns that you're talking about. 
Right. And then, and, and we kind of have a similar protocol at our house. It's, it's to wipe down the package and then uh, open it, remove the contents and then immediately wash your hands before touching your face. Right. And that should actually pretty much uh, keep, you know, keep you safe. Even if the, even if the package is contaminated, between wiping it down and then washing your hands after touching it before you touch your face, you're basically mitigating almost all of the risk that you possibly can at exactly. that point. Exactly. So the thing that you don't have to worry about is opening the box and kind of thinking all these coronavirus spores are going to come out at your face and you're going to inhale it into your lungs and you're going to get coronavirus. So, uh, so yeah, so that's not something that you need to worry about. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's really helpful for people. And also talking about the masks is huge. Right. And, and, you know, again, this, this kind of gets back to uh, rational versus irrational behavior. You know, the stock t- filing of, of toilet paper is, is going to be the, like, the never-ending meme from this crisis, right? right. Of, of uh, you know, why is toilet paper the thing you need in this, in this crisis? Like, uh, there's a lot of options, you know, if you run out of toilet paper. But, you know, hey, buying a reasonable amount of food, that's a, that's a smart, rational decision stockpiling two years worth of toilet paper, maybe not so rational. And that's what people are talking about when they're saying, you know, panic buying. So it's, it's actually just the ability to make these good decisions and go, okay, you know, what is my percentage threat here? And, you know, how can I mitigate that threat? Right. And that, you know, that's kind of a military lens to, you know, combating the viruses, uh, you know, okay, you know, what are our objectives? Okay. The first objective is not to overwhelm the medical community. So, you know, how do I do that? staying home and trying not to transmit to other people. Check. Okay. If I'm staying at home and I don't have it, then I want to prevent myself from getting it. Then I can take these, you know, the the precautions we just talked about with the hand washing and wiping things down. You know, again, you want to match the response to the threat level of of what it is you're actually dealing with. And, uh, and, you know, just, just think through the inevitable scenarios. And again, like we keep harping on for this, assess the downside. Hey, you know what, what's the downside of me wiping my packages off for a month and spending 30 extra seconds doing that? Well, it's, it's really very low, right? And maybe I look stupid on social media uh, and everybody goes, oh, hey, Mike, you were freaking out about your packages. Like, I just don't care. I've made a good decision with the data that I've, that I've assessed at this point, right? And, and, it, and it costs me very little to, to engage in some of these behaviors. Exactly. So... Well, anything, uh, anything else you want to kind of, any questions that seem to come up? I think, uh, you know, we covered the, the basis on this in terms of kind of teaching people, hey, you know, look at the downside, look at the upside. And this is for anything that you, you decide to do on, right? You know, it's like people were, you know, prior to this getting real big, uh, you know, my family, we, we cancel all our trips, right? So the question was, hey, you know, is it worth like canceling? Jesus, you know, like everybody, you know, we're kind of sick of the cold. We got to go, you know, there's a cruise, there's, you know, people want to go to Disneyland, right? So right. it was, it was pretty easy, right? It's like, hey, you know, we're going to have other opportunities to go, you know, travel or whatever it is. Again, coming from a position of, you know, kind of privilege is, hey, we could do that. But again, what's the downside? Downside, getting quarantined on a cruise ship where there was a spreading coronavirus, you know, kind of issue on the ship, right? You know, kind of picking it up from some other place, getting sick in, let's say, a different state where you have no family to help you, you know? I mean, I think those are all things to kind of consider, right? Those are kind of the, it's downside versus upside. What's my upside? Yeah, I have a great time, but could I spend time with my family at home, you know, could I, you know, take the kids, you know, and, and spend time with them, you know, kids right now. Yeah. It's great to go on a trip, but really it's, it's spending time with them. Right? That's, that's really what they care about. So when you look Absolutely. at what, what you, when you look at what's really important, right, it's not so much as a trip, but really, you know, this is, it's a little bit of a blessing. We all get to spend a lot more time with family um, kind of over these, you know, kind of next weeks, months, whatever it may be. Right. Yeah. And so actually, uh, that's, that's something else I think is, is worth addressing, um, is, is sensitivity and, uh, and, and attitude and outlook on this thing. So, uh, I think it's really important for people to understand that you can give this thing, uh, the, the, the full consideration and, and look at the data and, and recognize that this could be a very big deal. That doesn't mean we're trying to spread fear and, or that it, it, we're afraid ourselves. I'm not afraid of that. You know, I'm just taking precautions um, in order to, you know, try and, and mitigate uh, the risks that I see. Um, but, you know, I, I saw, I'm starting to see this attitude on social media pop up of like, oh, this is just what the human race needs, and look, look what it's doing to the environment, and now we're we're all connected again, and we're not polluting, and 
And, uh, you know, so it is important to see the silver linings in a, in a hard situation, right? And keep a positive mental attitude. However, there's also a sensitivity issue here with, you know, uh, the, the impact of this on uh, people. First of all, the obvious one is people are dying and people are suffering. Uh, people are losing loved ones. Uh, and then the economic impact, people are losing their jobs, uh, you know, restaurants, bars, hotels, uh, retail. I mean, there, there are so many people that are going to be out of work as a result of, of this tragedy, because that's, that's what this is. This is, this is an actual tragedy. And so, uh, you know, my, my thing that I would want to do is just, just tell people, hey, if you're in a place of privilege, hold up in your house because you have the ability to work from home, you can work from a computer, uh, and you had, you know, a, a, an extra thousand dollars to buy groceries, it's wildly insensitive to go out there and say, this is a blessing to the human race, and this is just what we need, right? Think about who's going to be affected here and, and, and give uh, some compassion to the people that, that you know, aren't as privileged as, as Ted and I and, and have the ability to sit here and record a podcast talking about the danger of this thing who are out there either in an essential job, putting their life on the line potentially to, to help people or uh, you know, people that are living paycheck to paycheck or, uh, you know, or have kids to feed and don't have any means of, of support. This is a very real crisis for those people. And, and while we're talking about upside versus downside, you know, my downside is very low. The downside for, for people who are living paycheck to paycheck getting this virus is tremendous, right? If they, if they can't work now or if they lose, you know, they lose a primary breadwinner, uh, you know, to illness in, in the family. So, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of compassion is, is really important right now. And yeah, hey, is there silver linings here? Is this thing banding people together? Yeah, I think so. I think there are some upsides for humanity. But being insensitive and saying this is a great thing for humanity, I think, is just is just the wrong message we want to be putting out there. And it, and it also doesn't uh, you know, give credit to how bad this thing could actually get. Right. And that's and that's the big thing that I would I would want people to remember is we just don't know yet. We just don't know how bad this is going to be. So we're, we're, we're acting in a way that that you know, mitigates that risk. And, and, you know, if we if we act this way and it ends up being no big deal, it's actually because we acted. In, in, the, in the correct manner. So, you know, it's, it may appear that we've taken all these precautions and then it was no big deal because it blew over, but it's precisely because we did take those precautions that it's blowing over. So, so that's a big thing to realize is that, hey, if you're, if you're trying to just adhere to these simple procedures by, by social distancing and, you know, wiping surfaces down and, and hand washing and doing the things Ted talked about, you are actually helping the greater good. You're helping society, you're helping humanity by trying to eradicate this thing. And, and there's nothing wrong with that and there's nothing to be ashamed of. Absolutely. Well said. And everything that you do, right, helps, helps that person next to you, right? It helps your community, whatever situation that you, uh, that you, they may or you may be in. So I think that's really well said. You know, this is something that, you know, affects all of us. And, you know, for, for those, like you said, that aren't in positions of privilege, right? There, there are things that we could do as a community, be compassionate for other people's, you know, positions because, you know, you're not in their shoes. You don't know what is going on. You know, so for some people, yeah, they may need to be out there, right? They may need to find some means of work, whatever it is, because that's just their situation. Also be, be conscious and considerate of that as well. Yeah, totally. And, and you know, it's, uh, I mean, there, there are, again, some, some really great things for humanity, us binding together, spending more time with family, like you talked about, you know, I mean, uh, again, not to sound insensitive from my place of privilege, but. I'm actually having a blast staying at home, connecting with my kids. Uh, I'm, I'm working out more than I was before. I'm getting actual work done. Uh, it, it's actually been a very productive couple of weeks. So, so yeah, are there some positives coming out of this? Sure. But also recognizing that, you know, yeah, I'm in, I'm in this tremendous place of privilege and, and it, it's really tough out there. And there are a lot of people suffering now and there's a lot of people that are going to suffer more uh, as a result of this thing. Yeah. So, well, hey, thank you so much, Mike. And you know, I think uh, we'll we'll kind of if we come up with any other good topics, we'll we'll kind of bring it together. And then, uh, yeah, I think uh, you know, step at a time. Hopefully, this gives people a little bit of idea in terms of as we move forward. You know, I think you know the you know the disease is already revealing itself that it's it's going to be an issue. You know, kind of these you know, quarantines or these kind of lockdowns is is probably going to be uh, well advised, uh, you know, kind of seeing what's going on in New York, Washington state, Italy, for example. So 
So, yeah, so I think, you know, kind of moving down the road, you know, um, we'll probably come up with some topics in terms of, you know, hey, how to prepare and how to stay a few steps ahead of the game so you're not reactive and you can prepare because that's how you prevent panic. That's how you can make sure you can ride out the storms and, and things along those lines, both from uh, just an everyday kind of perspective, from a medical perspective, uh, as well as from an economic perspective. I love it. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ted. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for your time, Mike. I appreciate it, man. Okay. See you, pal. Bye.